All right, well, we'll get started. Um, looks like we're streaming. So hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Lael Tate. I work at the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board with the Thrive Project. Tribal health reaching out involves everyone. Um, I am Navajo and I grew up in Portland, Oregon, um, which is where I'm calling to you all from. So I'm really happy to be here and to be with some of our wonderful guests that we have today on our um, mental health session, part of Communities of Healing. Uh, I'm just gonna give a little bit of background about this week long collaboration we've been doing and what these power hours have been about. So um, this week we've been doing a collaboration between the Native Wellness Institute we are Native at the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board and the Center for Native American Youth. And this collaboration has really been focused on um, promoting self-love and self-care among Indigenous youth all across everywhere um, and just really promoting that healing and that health and that empowerment and self-love um, for our youth. And also for kind of providing resources for caring adults um, who may want it, who may be wanting to help Native youth um, who are in those positions to help folks. So um, this has been a really wonderful collaboration between We Are Native, um, Center for Native American Youth and Native Wellness Institute. Um, this week, we've been doing some really awesome power hours a part of this collaboration. So our first one was focused on physical health and how we can maintain our physical well-being. Our second one was focused on emotional health um, this is our third one. It's focused on mental health. And then tomorrow we'll be kind of ending this, um, these focuses of well being with spiritual health. So I'm really happy you're all joining us. Um, and now I'd love our panel. We have some awesome guests here today, um, if they would introduce themselves. So I will just start with the first person on my screen, which is Donica. If you could just introduce yourself, um, what you do, and yeah, that'd be awesome. Hi, uh, I'm Donica, and um, I'm a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and a descendant of the Scottish uh, people. My mother is a member of the Ross clan, and um, I am the behavioral health manager at the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board. Thank you, Donica. Josh, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, hello, Malu today, and family Fifi and Final Maria Guanige Fatai, Wokoloto, Mukimoto. My name is uh, Joshua Cocker. My Kiowa name is Konguluka. My mom's people are now in Oklahoma, the Anadarko, Redstone, all that area over there. And my dad's people are from the Kingdom of Tonga in the South Pacific. I was born in New Zealand uh, and currently live in. Um, a place just outside of Santa Barbara. To the Chumash people, it's known as Kalawa Shock. Uh, I live there with my partner and our kids. Um, but now it's called Santa Inez. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm in, the, in my truck in the woods. Um, so yeah, I'm up in Washington. Really happy to be here with you guys and super stoked to be talking about this. Really important stuff. Thank you. Thank you so much, Josh. Michelle, would you like to go next? Thanks, Lael. Yet, eh, Michelle Singer, Yenish, et, Odich, Ini, Nishlin, Ado, Honagahni, Bashit, in, Tachi, Tach, Ini, Dash, Nella, Tachi, excuse me, Tachi, Da, Shinella, Ado, the Bethlehem, and the Shamasana. Um, thank you so much. Um, my name is Michelle Singer. I'm Navajo. I uh, am the Healthy Native Youth Project Manager at the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board. And I'm excited to be here today. Uh, the Healthy Native Youth Project is a one-stop shop educator portal for um, culturally and age-appropriate curricula around adolescent health. And so I work primarily with educators and caring adults who engage youth. And so I'm uh, happy to be here. Thanks. Thank you, Michelle and Robert, if you'd like to close us out with introductions. I say halito, halito, Danica. <laughs> All right. Well, my name is Robert Johnston. I'm with the Native Wellness Institute. I am here in sunny Arizona, wishing I was where Josh is. Josh, any luck? Yeah, I uh, got a day the other day, 22 yards. Got him Whoa, on the that is awesome. Good for you. Good for you. 
And I'm happy to be here with uh, the panelists here, uh, seeing everyone. Uh, Donica, from uh, on my father's side, from the Choctaw Nation, from my mother's side, from the Muscogee. Uh, but I live in Arizona near Michelle's uh, people over there. <laughs> Michelle, where did you grow up? I grew up back and forth between Oregon and uh, Arizona, New Mexico, Kienta, Arizona. Oh, okay. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. So, yeah, just really happy to be here with all of you, you folks and uh, looking forward to sharing. Awesome. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, thank you all for introducing yourselves. It's just a really great group of people um, with different interests and expertises. So it'll be a cool conversation. Um, for those of you just joining today, we are focused on mental well-being, mental health, um, how we can heal ourselves and our communities, and really focusing on um, just our mental well-being in that part of our lives. Um, this is also a collaboration that's focused on self-love and self-care, promoting self-love and self-care for Native youth. Um, and so I'm excited to get to dive into this conversation and um, just hear from all of our panelists about what that kind of means to them and what that looks like to them. So our first question for today is, what does mental well-being look like to you? Um, and I'm wondering if there's anyone who just wants to jump in and kind of kick off with that question. All right, I'll let Donica go. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, when we think about mental health, um, it's really a lot about how we think about things um, and our intellectual well-being, which obviously is like related to all of the other things, you know, um, we can't really separate them all out the way we think and feel our spiritual connection and our physical connection are all related, right? But really when we, the way that we think about uh, things and our intellectual well-being. So for me, um, when I'm thinking about mental wellness um, and well, mental health, it's not just about how I think about myself, but how I think about myself in the world in relationship um, to uh, the land, to um, my relatives, to my community, uh, to my ancestors. Um, and so um, I, I spent a lot of time, it's also about learning and growing intellectually. So for me, especially now in my life, I'm older that I, I really like to read and engage in like intellectual discussions with people. Um, and I find that when I'm using my brain and my intellect, I feel better um, and I feel more engaged in, um, in the world. So I think that that's for me a, a big part of it. And when I'm thinking about things and able to process and think things through, um, my emotional, physical, and spiritual well being uh, become more imbalanced. Thank you so much, Jonica. That, I think that was a great way to kick us off. Um, I'm going to go to Josh next. So the question is, what does mental well-being look like to you? Yeah. Oh, man. Um, when I think of, like, mental well-being, mental uh, health, um, I often refer back to uh, the medicine wheel style teachings of, like, mental, physical, and spiritual uh, and emotional, much like uh, Donica was saying, they're all connected for sure. Um, I also like to, uh, in my own mind and life, kind of refer back to like my people's standards, those who I come from. So in, in Kiowa uh, culture, um, we believe that everything you have and are came to you by someone or something else. So the language that I speak is not mine. The body that I have is not mine. The air that I breathe is not mine. And so I have to know where those things come from in order to be able to love them in the appropriate way. <clears throat> and so like, oh, this, this ability to be well mentally um, is, is another gift from the people that I come from. And on my dad's side, the pinnacle, I believe one of the, the highest like achievements you could um, you could have as a, as a person, for me personally, as a, as a young man or a man, uh, is to be a, a navigator, celestial navigator, a wayfinder. Um, and that requires an individual to be out in a wooden boat tied together by ropes made from 
uh, coconut husk uh, for months at a time, you know, sailing the ocean with a seemingly endless horizon, taking in the clouds, uh, formations, uh, wind direction, wave patterns, swell patterns, like position of the moon and stars and sun. Like, that's a lot of focus. And so those people had to not only deal with what was going on with the group that they were with, but also maintain um, maintain their wits to be able to, to decipher the world around them that was ever changing. And then on my on my mom's side, the, the Kyle side, uh, really, <clears throat> for someone of my age, it would be uh, like fatherhood, warriorhood, and and before it would be preparing for our coming of age ceremonies uh, and being able to like strike out on our own so that we could be a strong individual to contribute to the community so that our community became stronger because of that individual. Um, and I often think of like, I'm a very like tactile person. So uh, I often think of, of mental wellness um, as a, as a physical practice. <laughs> and so to me, that's what it means. It means combining uh, those like physical practices of our people. For example, making fire with natural materials or putting up a teepee and knowing how to do that, uh, being able to fish, um, being able to, to hunt, being able to do the things that our ancestors did because they had those physical practices that were tied to these principles. And when those things came to the individual, came alive to the individual, like they were changed. They were changed. And so that's, that's really what I, what I think of when I, uh, when I think about that question. I hope I answered that. I was trying to catch like the spirit of it when you asked this. <laughs> no, that was awesome. Thank you, Josh. I think, yeah, that's that's really a really great way to look at it. Um, and yeah, every it's all all of these different pieces of our wellness and our health are so connected. So we really have to think about them kind of together and hold them together. Um, I think you really pointed to that really well. So thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna pass it on to Michelle. So the question is, what does mental well-being look like to you? Thanks, Liel, and I really am honored again. I, I want to say this, that I'm honored to be with the folks on the panel today um, and the good words that were already shared. When I think about what mental well-being is to me, um, I certainly do believe that, as it was stated, you can't just cherry pick. It's one thing, your physical or emotional or cultural or spiritual. It's, it's the whole, the whole holistic um, way of thinking. Um, hence, you hear the words of medicine wheel or wellness model, what have you. And I think I lean a lot on my Navajo teachings, the Navajo uh, kind of indigenous framework, if you will, the way of, of everything of looking about where you're at in your mind and to your heart and to the land and um, your fitness, your spiritual fitness, where is that all at? And if one is in balance and harmonious, Navajo word is hojong, that means like Zen, you're in balance. You've got all these things that, and, and that's a hard thing to strive for each and every day, because I think there's some things where um, are out of my control. There's some things that are, I have control over my actions, my behaviors, my thoughts, and then being able to realize that um, to try to understand the difference between the two. For mental well-being, when I know that I'm not in balance, I can sense it, I can feel it. Um, it might be in those emotions or behaviors. I get anxious, I get stressed, I get worried, or fear is really overwhelming me. And it's going to make me um, do things or say things or think things that I know are not um, things in a good way. And when I have those type of that imbalance, that's when I know I'm not in a good mental well-being state. And so, um, so that's something that I, I think about. And so what I would do is I need to take a step back and pause and really listen and take a time of reflection. And so, um, I, I try not to let my emotions and my thinking overwhelm. And I think there's a saying of saying the longest journey that travels is from the mind to the heart, right? Even though it's right here, you know? So really having a pulse and understanding of oneself 
your true self um, is very important. It's not easy. It's a lifetime of and a, life, a journey to be able to understand where one is at in life. But that's what I think about when it comes to mental well-being. Thank you for that, Michelle. I really appreciate, um, yeah, that piece about balance and you can sense that imbalance and um, and that that is so important to how we how we kind of think about things and our mental well-being. So thank you, Michelle, for that. Um, and then Robert, just to finish up with this one question, the question is, what does mental well-being look like to you? So I, I think I'm gonna go a little bit old school with this answer. <laughs> But when I think of mental, just overall what mental health is, it's, uh, I, I look at from the healthy side of when your spirit and intentions match your behaviors and actions. It's uh, when there's a clear path that is streamlined from creator's purpose to what you're given to the world. Um, you know, when, when we come into this world, um, we, we communicate, we share. We think of, uh, we, you know, we may not be formalized in words, what was our first need, but we come into this world asking through the cry, right? Uh, we come into this world ready to explore, to take new steps. And what happens when we fumbled up or failed those first steps? What do we do? We get up and try again, don't we? So we come into this world courageous and we come into this world explorative and we come into this world ready to learn and adjust and to ready to let go of old stuff, you know, to clear path for news, for new things to come. And that's a streamline for creator of a process that we need to, to be healthy in this world. And it's only through the influences, outside influences, that we start to limit how we take care of ourselves, how we take care of our thoughts. When we think about it, even being told, stop crying, you cry baby, knock it off. I think me and Josh both the experience, boys don't cry, right? That's limiting that process. So in a way it's, uh, it, it, you know, we find limitations out there in the world. And throughout time, you know, to, to continue to take care of ourselves mentally, we had to continually heal and be able to uh, uh, monitor what we're intaking and how that's affecting us and what are we doing to let go and how are we filtering out uh, what we need for ourselves, for our own development, even as adults, you know, we're still developing. So I think of mental health, there's a, a lot of things that go into it, but it really comes down to, it's just going back to that first need. And that is that ability to accept support, the ability to accept love so that we can be a movement of support and a movement of love uh, throughout our life. But that's what I think of when I think of mental health. Thank you, Robert. Thank you so much for your answer and your words. Um, I think that's so, so needed for so many people to hear. Um, just the encouragement to accept support and accept love. And um, yeah, so thank you for that. And also, I really appreciate your piece about kind of getting back up after you make mistakes and how that is so related to mental health. I think it's so easy if we make a mistake or if we have a setback or, you know, with, with the times that we're experiencing to really get um, down, but to remember that we we have that resilience from our from our family, from our ancestors, and in us. So I I think I'm really thankful for that you know reminder of that. Um, I think this kind of goes well into our next question. Um, so thinking right now during this time of all of the struggles that our people are facing, and that so many of um, other groups within this country are facing with. Um, a revolution and a pandemic and just recently the wildfires on the west coast. Um, I'm wondering what are some strategies you all use to kind of take care of yourself, to check in on yourself, to really practice self-care for your mental health. Um, so the question is how do you take care of your mental health? What are strategies you use? 
especially during this time. So I'll first open it up to see if anyone's super passionate with a question. And if not, I'll just choose someone. Mm -hmm. I'll start it off since my, uh, I forgot to unmute myself already. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Robert. I, I'll just put uh, this little process in of, you know, uh, and it started back with an elder, uh, Charlie Tailfeathers. And it was during the, t at the beginning of the pandemic when we were told, check on our elders, check on our elders. And so, you know, I, I, I checked in on Charlie and we talked for a long time. And after that conversation, and, and, and through this conversation, he was so excited he was so excited during this time where everyone was just full, uh, filled with fear. And he was excited because he had time with his grandchildren. And he said that, that he hopes he has enough time to share all that he needs to share with them. And he was very active in that. And getting off that call reminded me of something of like, of what our elders purpose is, and that's to guide us. And, you know, so when we had society telling us, well, check on your elders, they're most vulnerable. You know, we're vulnerable too. And when I checked on my elder, what I saw was that I needed that for me. You know, my elder is my measuring tool to let me know how am I doing, right? How am I taking care of myself? How am I uh, maintaining during this time? But as we know, that life circle goes both ways for us to learn. So at the same time, I'm real grateful that as a basketball coach, you know, I, 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 have contact a lot of young people and it's good for them to also check up on me. How am I doing? What, what can I be doing for you more? You know, uh, because that for us, you know, through, through our life, you know, that that's part of, we need that from both sides. Uh, you know, I being a teacher and student throughout life, we can't just focus on being only a teacher and think that uh, we have nothing to gain or learn from our young people. You know, we need them to keep us in check as well because they're a part of this process. As we know, it's like we pray for next generations, right? Well, as we pray for next generations, we have to be prepared for the next generations to receive those prayers and to see, think differently and do things differently than our generation and see that as a blessing rather than a threat. So uh, being open to what these young ones are doing, that's, uh, that's uh, a good way, a self-check a good self-check, I should say, um, because if I'm taking things personally, what I see from young people, even when it comes down to music, how can they listen to this music? You got to think to yourself, what place where, I, where I'm at, because how would I like it if someone would tell me about what's appropriate there? So that's, uh, I just wanted to share that. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, that kind of shift in perspective and um, kind of noticing our roles that we play with other people is really really important and yeah, thank you for that. Um, and yeah, checking in on our elders, but also that's such a big piece of, we need to be checked on also um, in all of our ages as young people or you know any, any stage of life we're in, um, we need to have that connection with our, with our relatives and our community members. So thank you for that reminder. Um, I think I'll just go reverse order. So Michelle, um, what are some strategies you use and what does self-care what are some, how do you practice self-care for your mental health during this time? Boy, I can tell you honestly, this year has been probably one of the most difficult I have ever experienced in my life in the living. And what I mean by that is um, in 2011, I lost a brother and a dad three and a half months apart. And I, I can't even really remember that year, you know, in, in, and so to go through this year, um, and that was very difficult and there's still a lot of coping with grief and loss in that way. However, now in this particular year, all that you've listed between a pandemic, a global pandemic, you know, the wildfires and all the restrictions and and uh, having to turn one's life upside down really tested my faith, really tested my um, uh, ways of thinking and therefore it affected my mental health. It affected my, and, and what I mean by in the living meaning is that um, I've, I had to really, as Robert mentioned, is 
you know, I had to check on my elder, my mother, you know, and my mentors who are elders, whether it be by text or by phone, and had to literally um, be there to care give for someone else. And that for me was an experience that was humbling and I was so grateful I could do it. Um, my work allowed me to work remotely there. And it challenged me to have a, a loved one, one has to care for and um, caregiving for an elder. Is, it's like caregiving for a, a young person. Again, you're, you're going through that cycle. It's like they're morphing back into that, into the cycle of life where they they are preparing themselves and that was hard for me um it was challenging and however what i needed to do in those times was talk talk to other people and say i need help i can't do this all on my own it also created a lot of stress and anxiety for me. And in a COVID environment, what could one do? Well, I could go out and I could go walking. I had to lean, lean very much on my spiritual foundation. I had to give it to creator. I had to um, open myself up and be willing to, to believe in something greater than myself will show me the way or give me a thought, but also to I couldn't just grin and bear it. I had to reach out to my friends, to neighbors, to people in the community, to other people. And it was hard for me to ask for help because I thought, okay, I can do it. But I realized the strong native woman is a myth in my head. I can handle it all and I couldn't. And that was a real humbling experience for me. So what I did just lean on my faith lean on my community of friends and also to get outside and breathe some fresh air, go running, go for a walk. Um, don't look at the computer screen all the time, pick up the phone and call someone. Get outside of myself, my busy brain and reach out to someone else. And usually what happened was I felt so much better. I completely forgot what was going on in life. So, that to me was a strategy um, that frankly saved my life when I knew I was going down fast at times. And my friends, my family, my relatives were there for me and, and I'm so grateful. But even at this age, it still worked to ask for help. Thank you so much for sharing, Michelle. It's, it's just such an honor to hear you share about that and um, I think your honesty and kind of vulnerability with with us and with this um, group is just really, really special. So thank you so much for that. Um, and I think that piece of like asking for help is so hard and I can totally relate to that. Um, and also it's, it's really difficult during this time to find ways to practice self-care and to reach out for help because so many of those ways are so different right now. So thanks for sharing about that and also sharing um, the strategies you used to really kind of keep yourself healthy and, and stay strong during this time. So thank you, Michelle. Um, and then I'm gonna go on to Josh. So the question is, what strategies do you use and how do you take care of your mental health during this time? Oh, uh... I love, um, I love the, uh, two comments before by Michelle and Robert. It's, I kind of, when I was listening, a common thing that was, that I found between both of them was connection. I think that's super important in a time where we can't physically be around other people. <laughs> it's important to remember that we are connected and try to build upon those connections in every way that we can. Um, and I feel like, that that's kind of been a really big theme of this particular year um, in terms of like my own mental well-being. Uh, some of the things that, that we've been doing as like a, a family, um, our little three-year-old has a bow and I have a bow, my partner has a bow. So we all shoot. And now that we have like a baby baby who's just born uh, in July, um, we, we try to do like family things together so 
um, burning cedar um, or cedaring off or, or burning smudge uh, and praying as a family. Um, also, like, we, we sing a lot together, so I'm learning my wife's songs and she's learning my songs. Uh, and we even like sometimes round dance with her in the living room as a, as a family to try to put her to sleep. So we try to do things like together in our little bubble as much as possible. I know that, I know that some people are just, um, you know, by themselves or with just one other person and it can get kind of like, well, we've already done everything in the past six months together. So <laughs> finding new experiences to connect is, is super important. Another thing that I've been drawing super heavily on this year, uh, just in terms of like, mental well-being and practices to be able to help that out is we have all this time and the the wilderness uh our first mother mother earth nature gifted our people the wisdom to be able to build the cultures that we hold so dear and believe that there's so much power in and so taking the time to reconnect uh, and build upon connections that I have made uh, in the past and try to search new avenues of connection to the land that I'm that I'm in. So I said before, I'm living in um, Santa Inez, which to my partner's people is Kalawa Shock, which means Turtle Village. That land is not mine. That air that's being circulated through those trees has been there since the beginning of the time, and it was, it was breathed by their ancestors. And so every time we draw breath, I'm like, connecting to those people but I'm also learning new ways of looking at the world because their place is different to my place and uh it's been a little bit of a science project it's been a little bit of a building project it's been a little bit of all kinds of projects just to find out like what is my place in this space and it, I mean sometimes it's it's what plants are edible around you know other times it's where are the best swimming holes uh and sometimes too it's uh, tell me more about that song that comes from this place. Tell me the story. Those little moments have helped me a ton because that's how I find my safe space. Uh, my identity is like the safest place that I have. And it is born out of the places that I come from. Ever since I was a little kid, it was like we, we go to ceremony and you hear your elders talk and people lift them up and praise them and give them gifts. And so when I was really little, I was like, oh, those guys are the ones who are getting all the love. I guess we got to be like them. And I, on my dad's side, on, on my Tongan side, kind of same thing, same thing. And I was really blessed to be able to have these people who were receiving that type of love um, and who did right by that love as well, who taught us the right way to go about things. And, you know, they would say things like, our culture is the safest thing that we have. And if we keep this as a people, then we will be made whole. Anything that that comes to us can be like any anything that's hard like fire gets into a rock at sweat it can be taken away sometimes you have to hold on to it for a while but that water is going to come if you go the right way and so um yeah just trying to trying to keep my mind in the right places like we don't we can go to ceremony this year which is a big thing so we talk about dancing is healing and we talk about um how ceremony is is sacred and that is also healing you know those spaces we're literally working. Uh, you you can't really, you know, you can't really get healing if you just sit around and think about it or talk about it. You got to do something about it. And when we're in those spaces, our people have given us a, a, a place to do something about it. And so when we're out there and we're dancing and we're singing and we're letting out those war cries and listening to those lulus and eating all of that food, we have the opportunity to heal. And it's when we bring all of those hardships from the year to those spaces and dancing out of us and just let it be there because you know that that circle can take it um it's i believe that's the space where we can like start again just hit the refresh button and um this year we didn't have that but we can still prepare we can still prepare and so that's been like a really big thing in our family and so i talked about shooting i talked about you know finding out about edible plants and, and learning my space around uh that place um i i really feel like I really feel like that's something that uh, one is free <laughs> and two, I've never been far from everywhere I've gone there's been some type of wilderness I and mean, even in the larger cities that I've lived in. Um, and it's important to know and to remember that our first mother gave our people the resilience that we talk about all the time across all platforms of media. 
uh, and that we hold up and revere, tell us stories about. And we'll stop there and talk to us. And we don't necessarily have to be fluent in our language with the longest hair and know everything that our ancestors did and live like them in order to be able to receive the blessings that she has waiting for us. It's just a matter of going out and becoming connected to the world around you, allowing the natural world to speak to us in a way that helps us understand the rest of the world around us. Um, that's a really roundabout answer, but I, I hope that helped, uh, and I feel like that was the most honest answer I could give right now. <laughs> Oh, one more thing, actually, sorry. These Zoom calls uh, and power hours have been a tremendous help. So it's been crazy to to not be able to, like, see all my friends um, that I'm so used to working with and traveling with, but being able to just, like, look at them through a screen uh, and connect that way has been incredibly helpful, too. And I, I really feel like, um, you know, creators wanting our people to succeed, I feel like this is part of that success too, being able to connect and talk about these things and let the um, let these hard topics that might be difficult to talk about in certain places, uh, yeah, have access to, to ideas and perspectives that otherwise would be outside of our realm. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm super glad to be here with you guys. Thanks. Awesome. Thank Gosh, you. That, that sound of rain is in the Northwest is the best sound in the world. <laughs> It's really cold. It's really cold up here, man. Awesome. Thank you so much, Josh. Um, yeah, it just gave us so many great examples, and I love hearing the things you're doing with your family right now. Um, it's just really, really great to hear. So thank you for that. Um, and lastly, I'll go to Donica. if there's any strategies or how you take care of your mental health right now. Yeah, I, I mean, I just want to echo a lot of what... Um, everyone's already shared, but I want to kind of go in a little bit different direction, specifically around the way our brains process uh, trauma um, during, uh, during historical traumatic events in particular. And we're experiencing three historical traumatic events kind of all at once. And so I just want to talk briefly about what happens in the brain. Um, so when we're in crisis, um, our limbic system, which is the really, really old part of our brain, it's a primitive part of our brain, um, is, is uh, activated. Um, and then it throws us into this fight, flight, or freeze response. Um, and when we're in these like pandemics and the wildfires and these um, uprisings, um, most of us have not lived through a lot of these things, especially a pandemic, so our brain doesn't really know which one to go to, flight, flight, or freeze, and so it kind of cycles through all of these different things. Um, <clears throat> and, and when that happens, a lot of uh, our brain resources, a lot of blood, a lot of calories, a lot of things are spent in that part of our brain, which is not really connected to the other parts of our brain like memory and language and communication and all of these things. That's why we're finding ourselves having a hard time communicating and connecting and we're feeling tired and we're feeling like we don't want to get out of bed and um, feeling detached. And so, and like what everyone shared is like our ancestors were really smart. And um, so some of the things that we can do to bring our brain, to bring our mental health back into practice are those lessons that our ancestors taught us, right? So our brains are wired for ritual. So one of the best things that we can do for ourselves, for our mental, spiritual, emotional, and physical health is to do ritual. Get up at the same time of day, um, for me, like I get up every day, I uh, burn medicine, um, you know, I burn sweet grass in particular, and, and I thank my ancestors for their strength and for their guidance in this time. And then every morning, um, I make my coffee. Um, at our work, we have a morning check-in, we do our morning check-ins. Um, and, you know, you do, you have this ritual, recreate, create a ritual and a habit um, and reconnect with your ancestors, right? Um, ask them for guidance, ask them 
um, and connect with them, especially since we're being asked to physically distance. Our ancestors are there with us. And if we, we slow down and we process and we ask for guidance, they're gonna be there. Um, and then connecting with people in, in whichever ways that we can, um, I think are really, really important. The other really easy, good thing that we can do to regulate our system, to regulate our parasympathetic system, to get our brain kind of working better is to box breathe. And I put in the link um, and maybe we can post on the Facebook page, uh, um, it's a gift to, um, to box breathe. But what box breathing does is you inhale um, for four or five counts, hold for four counts, exhale for six counts, inhale for four or five counts, hold for four counts, exhale for six counts. If you box breathe, it does a lot of different things. It helps your heart to regulate, but it brings oxygen to your brain and it helps your brain to communicate, that limbic system to communicate with other parts of your brain. Um, and so it's just one of the most easy things. And when we were in prayer, right, that's what we did. You take a deep breath in, you hold it, you exhale, you get grounded, and then you communicate with your ancestors and then you can hear what those messages are. Like these are all things that we understand now in Western science that our indigenous science already knew. So we'll be also patient with Western scientists. Um, I'm a Western and indigenous scientist and I just try to be patient, but we go back to those teachings. And I think that that box breathing in particular, you do it a couple minutes, a couple times a day, um, it's really going to help our brains to regulate for us to be able to think more clearly and thoughtfully. Um, and it helps our parasympathetic nervous system to settle down um, because right now we're just in crisis and it's crazy and that's why we're tired. And I am too. Oh boy, oh boy, I'm tired. And I'm just like really grateful for those that lessons from my ancestors, but also for my community. Um, I'm really grateful for my organization. And then like Josh just said too, like having these spaces where we can gather um, and share story and share space, um, even if it's virtually um, in these times is really helpful. Thank you so much, Donica. I think that's so helpful to kind of understand more of like what's going on in our, in our body. I know it's really nice for me to understand um, just to kind of get some clarity and also kind of see how um, those like practices that you're talking about, like deep, those that breathing and just taking that moment is something that our ancestors have done and um, that we we can continue to do. It's interesting. I, I feel like so often during the day, I'll just notice like I'm so tense or I'm I'm not really taking deep breaths. So I remember we I was a part of one of your um, webinars before and you were talking about that deep breathing and that box breathing and so I try to remember that and like okay I need to take a second and just like untense and uh, take a deep breath so that's something that's really helpful and like a really um, amazing strategy so thank you for that. Um, so we actually got a question in um, a comment from the Facebook chat and I'm going to read it and then I'm wondering if Donica if you would want to start off answering it and then if anyone else wants to answer it as well. So the question that we got from um, someone in, who was watching is, do you have any suggestions how to help and encourage others to heal? We all have friends and family that struggle to accept love as a way of getting through trauma or trust, et cetera. So suggestions on helping others heal and encouraging them to heal. Yeah, I think that's a really amazing question. Um, I think one of the things that happens, especially for those of us who were kind of born and raised to be caregivers is that we really want to jump into fixing everything. Um, and what we know now is like really the most powerful, I think, tool we have um, as human beings is to be empathetic, um, to just sit and listen to people in their pain, um, in their sorrow, in their grief, but also in their joy and their love 
um, and not to, uh, to try to fix things. And that's really hard for us. And I'm a fixer, I'm a doer. Like I wanna jump into like, let's figure out and, and so, you know, solution, like develop solutions for how to fix this problem. Um, and for a lot of us, especially we're, when we're in that trauma response, when we're, you know, triggered or we're, you know, in that response, what is the most helpful thing we can do is just sit with someone, to just be in the pain with someone, to just be in the moment with someone. And that's a really hard place to be. Um, we, we always try to silver line things, you know, and make things better. And, and you know, sometimes um, when we do that, it feels, it feels like we're not listening and not, not being present. And so I think really the most powerful thing we have is that empathy. Just saying, you know, sometimes you just don't even know what to say and it's okay. You just say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just really glad you shared it with me. And I'm just gonna sit here and listen to you and maybe sometimes cry with you or laugh with you or whatever it is you need. And so I think that that's just one of the most powerful things we, we can do is just be present. And it's really hard though, so. Thank you, Donica. Um, does anyone else have a kind of a response or thoughts on the question? And again, the question is, do you have any suggestions about how to help or and encourage others to heal? We all have friends and family that struggle to accept love as a way of getting through trauma or trust, et cetera. That, that is a tough question, uh, mainly because it's a good question. We all should be asking that. But, it, it, but um, you know, when it comes down to First of all, when, even when we're talking about love, love means so many things to different people. Uh, but you know, but if we focus on that, and let me just present it like this: I got a bottle of love right here, and this has worked for me. And whenever I drink it, I feel better when I drink this love. Okay, so that might work for me, right? Well, what happens is so many times we get used to this. Hey, if this worked for me, so you better drink it drink this and you'll feel like me or we're told this it's only going to get worse if you don't drink this you need to drink this right and there's so many ways that we try to present this in reality this is the only thing that we can really do right it's just put it there and not try to force and not try to threaten it's just put it there, right? And continue to do this and not get offended if they don't drink from this and not get hurt if they choose to ignore it. Because what we're doing, what we're doing is we're presenting what's called, you know, just the natural way. And we have a purpose in life. And as long as we are serving our purpose, right? That's the best we can do in hopes that at one point that, person or people will reach out and, and and i've seen that i mean i've had people come to tell me do not talk to me about healing or moving forward but yet they're the ones who approach me they want to talk to me but don't mention healing and moving forward i don't want to hear it okay right and listen and put this out there until they were ready to take it, but they took it. And once they did, they were the first ones to use the words healing and moving forward, right? So I think that's just something to kind of keep in perspective, uh, particularly with people in healing and, and meeting those needs is as much as we want them to heal, in the words of good friend, Jolene Joseph, we can't want it more than they can, right? But what we can do is just make sure that they know it's always there. So that's, that's what I want to share on that. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, and then I saw Michelle. Yeah, you want to hop in, Michelle? Yeah, I, I really appreciate the comments because I, I think it's just about keeping it real, you know, and the fact of being present and listening. And I, I want to clarify my comment earlier about the strong person, the strong woman. I heard that a lot, you know, at times when people say, oh, she's so strong. 
you know, oh, she can handle it, you know, she's strong. And I almost came to resent that because I'm like, I can be strong, but sometimes it's harder to be soft than it is to be strong. Soft meaning vulnerable, you know, meaning open to owning my feelings and where I'm at. And that also goes to other people as well too. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to feel those feelings and the thinking around it is, oh, I don't want people to see that or I'm, I'm, I, I myself don't wanna feel it. So maybe I'll drink that love you know, or in, in this case, it's substance. It could be something else to change my mood. Um, or I'm afraid what other people might think of me. I mean, that's all a farce. It's an illusion. You know, the reality is, is um, to own those feelings, to feel those feelings and leave, check my ego at the door or not fight fear, but the fear of feeling those frozen tears it's like, let it be. And that's how I felt as well as others that I see in, in dealing with trauma or loss or grieving, what have you. We're scared and that fear will, will, will act out in different ways. But feeling it and getting through it on its own time and on one's time, all you need to do is just be present. It just feels so good when to know that you're not alone and you're not struggling inside. We can't control it or not, but just letting go, leaning on faith in others. And again, back on ancestors, as I was walking before this, I was listening to the wind. I was listening and feeling the sun on my face, walking amongst the trees and seeing the leaves fall and remembering that there's beauty all around us, even though sometimes the darkest times might be like, I don't want to be here. But the reality is, is that I don't have to walk that walk alone and I can lean on other people and they're just like me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, love comes in different ways. We don't have to say it. It could be an act of kindness. It could be an affirmation. It could be just that touch on somebody, you know, it could be an act of service, you know, buying a cup of coffee as a gift, you know, it all is different but we've got to love ourselves and love others. So that's, that's the good medicine with humor. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Yes, with humor. I love that. <laughs> um, Josh, did you want to add anything to this question that someone entered? Um, suggestions how to help and encourage others to heal? Uh, yeah, just kind of... Um building off something Rob has said quite a few times to me, if I can uh, use your words here, Rob. Um, more often than not, it's all about access and opportunity. And so creating access for those people to join you in healing would be super helpful. Um, for us right now, we use like in our home, uh, kai time. So our Tongan word for food or eating is kai. And so when it's like kai time, we come together as a family in the kitchen, we're not playing, we're cooking, kids are like doing stuff, babies swinging. Um, but we're, we're, we're focusing on the purpose of like, okay, so we're gonna eat this food. We have to be mindful of how we are thinking and talking about things while we're around it. Can't be like talking smack about someone in the community while you're cooking food, cause you're gonna feed that to your kids. So like, oh, we gotta, we gotta be serious about this. And we use that time also to like, kind of break down things uh, in Tongan culture. So, you know, all over the country, since the pipeline protests, like water is life, true. In Tongan culture, they say food is love. When you show up to someone in order to like gift them the love that you have, you bring the best food that you can have. Um, like people will kill their, their pigs and cook their own pigs. I mean, in Tonga, they, they'll, they'll cook their dog for you um, if you show up just to, to, to wanna love you in that way, you know, give you the best things that they have. Um, <clears throat> so that's, something like you know uh and it's, it's all about intention because that's a great question um that's a great question but it it is a difficult space to navigate as well and so i just uh, agree with what everyone else is saying and just put that one thing in there if there's one thing that we can do um like rob said putting that that love there allowing them to be able to, to come to it when they're ready it's just us doing those things that help us along our way and inviting and leaving a space for them too 
So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Josh. Um, so we're coming up to the hour here and I just have one last question I want to ask all of you guys. Um, so the question is, what would be a message to your younger self or to this younger gen generation that you'd want to tell them or say to them? Um, and maybe I'll start it with Donica and we'll just go um, to Rob Josh after. Oh, you know, I really wish that when I was like 16 to 24 that I knew um, how much my ancestors loved me and how much they sacrificed for me. Um, and I mean, even now when I think about that love, like it just brings so much warmth to my heart and ease, ease to my spirit. Um, and that would be, I wish I had knew, I wish I had known and understood that the way that I do now. Thank you, Donica. How about, how about you, Josh? We did this once, a uh, similar question on an I-20 P like power way back when, and I, I had an answer. Uh, um, but since then, uh, I had the opportunity to see my daughter be born. Uh, her name is Sogia Holoma. I mean, she kills in the snow. I've had like similar year to everyone who's watching and a really uh, rocky road as a younger guy. But everything led to that moment. And so right now, I don't think I would give any advice, maybe a high five or something. But everything that has happened to my younger self um, led me to that moment. Uh, and now I have the opportunity to hunt for them right now. I mean, um, I said in the beginning, I'm, I'm in a truck in the woods. Uh, I'm out here with, with um, another young man, a mentor of mine, and an elder. Uh, and we're, we're hunting for our families. And I really feel like this is good for me and it's where, where I'm meant to be. So I, I think I'll just give him a high five. I'll keep going. <laughs> Love that. Thank you, Josh. That's awesome. Um, how about you, Michelle? Oh, gosh. I think back to when I was in high school and it was a very kind of gray time in my life. But I would say that in looking back, I would say you know, that, um, you know, I don't have to have all the answers mm -hmm. and I shouldn't worry about what other people think about me and I need to be to my true self. And that love is not like how it's depicted in the movies and in books. Love comes in a variety of different forms and that um, to always look to those who come before me and to give back to others because somebody else is watching and to lean on culture because it is prevention and let that ego be at the door and be open to having people offer guidance and, um, and uh, good luck because it's a journey. There's no such thing as perfect. It's all about life experience and learning from others and there's no shortcuts. So that's what I would say. Thank you, Michelle. And then Robert, just to kind of close us out, what would you say? Well, that's a tough question. You know, I just had a birthday last month and I been trying to connect with my elder self <laughs> more so than my younger self at this point. So I'm not sure if I have words for my younger self, but I definitely have words for a younger generation. And, and the words are simply do better, you know, do better. Um, my generation has had limited knowledge and limited access the, uh, more than your generation. And my generation and those older than mine have worked hard to prepare a home for you, the younger generation. But in doing so, we found some things that didn't belong in this home, but rather than get rid of, we just kind of put away in the closet. And your generation has opened that closet door and has seen it. Um, you have the means and the intelligence and the ability to clean out that closet. You have it within you to make those changes that's needed 
for this to be a more welcoming home for everyone. And so that's my challenge to you, younger, younger generation, is to do better. Your generation has more openness, more love, more compassion, more acceptance than the generations before. Use that as your guiding force and do better. But that's my message. Thank you so much for that, Robert. I think that's a perfect way for us to close. Um, thank you to all of our panelists for being here today. I appreciate your words and just what you've shared and taught us today. And it's been really nice for me to hear as a young person um, to hear all of your advice and your encouragement. So thank you for that. And thank you for everyone who's been watching and for your, your really thoughtful question that was submitted as a comment. Um, and we will be back again tomorrow doing focusing on spiritual health um, with our communities of healing. So thank you everyone.